Today, I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things, not so much from a consumer product point of view, but um, more for how it can be used for creative coding, education, and the intersection of all of that with magic. Um, Self said, I write bubble sort zines, which use drawings and stories to explain how computers work. Um, I go by Sailor HG on the internet. Um, bubble sort zines cover a wide range of topics from encryption to TCP IP uh, to memory caching. Um, and the most recent bubble sort zines issue is about hacking, hardware, and microcontroller programming. Um, and specifically, it's a step-by-step -step tutorial for how to take a chirping toy bird, I brought one. Um, so a chirping toy bird, um, uh, the wires attached, uh, I soldered them on, it didn't come this way. Oh, okay. Um, it's not? Okay, um, so the most recent bubble sort zine is about um, toy hacking, hardware hacking, and microcontroller programming using um, this chirping toy bird. Um, so it's a step-by-step -step tutorial for how to take a chirping toy bird, um, connecting it to an Arduino and to the Twitter API, and to make it chirp whenever you get an at reply or a DM on Twitter. Um, I thought it would be a good project for beginners while being a little bit more involved than uh, just make this LED blink. Um, and also, since your friends can at message you in order to make the bird chirp, it feels personal and interactive. So a few people have asked me how I came up with the idea of a toy bird that chirps as a project, um, a toy bird that chirps when you get a tweet as a project, um, and also how I have come up with some of the other projects I work on. And for so many of my projects, I'm inspired by some of my favorite fantasy books and by the idea of technology as being magic for muggles. So I like to imagine myself taking charms class at Hogwarts. And if you've never read Harry Potter or seen the movies, it's a branch of magic about adding behaviors to inanimate objects. So I like to imagine myself taking charms class at Hogwarts and I think to myself, what kind of objects would I want to enchant if I had that power? And with embedded programming, you basically do have that power. And since you do have that power, do you use it to animate your umbrella to remind you to bring it if it has a chance of rain? Or do you use it to animate your mirror to give you affirmations in the morning? There's so many possibilities for bringing household objects to life. Um, that could make your home basically like the Weasley house and would just require the object, a microcontroller, and maybe some sensors and actuators. And what makes me excited about the Internet of Things is that previously you could really only connect, or you could only make household objects react to things that they could sense. You could only make a household object react to the amount of noise or light or heat, for instance, within that the area immediately surrounding it by connecting it to various electronic sensors. But by connecting it to the internet, you can make an object react to the tide levels on the East Coast, or when you get an email, or to the weather, or any other piece of information that you can get via the internet. And this increases the creative possibilities for the kinds of magical devices you can make. And it might be worth mentioning, like Mike said, uh, that while I'm super excited about the internet of things, and all the possibilities um, with regards to creative coding and education and learning. Um, I don't think that every commercial household item has to be connected to the internet. There are privacy and security concerns about connecting all of your household objects to the internet, which is a huge topic altogether. And in some cases, a toaster is just better off being a toaster. Um, but if you feel like your day would be greatly improved by your toaster printing out the day's weather forecast on your toast in the morning, in my opinion, that's a great learning opportunity and a great reason to figure out how to connect your toaster to the internet. Um, so maybe what I'm saying is that I advocate using the internet of silly and ridiculous things for experimenting and learning hardware hacking and for delight. Um, so at the end of the zine on hardware hacking, 
and embedded programming after the reader has hacked the toy bird and connected it to Twitter, I invite them to keep exploring other household objects that they could enchant. I invite the reader to create fantastical things that they wished existed in the world but don't currently, um, and to use that to learn more about hardware, electricity, and microcontroller programming in the process. Finding creative projects that I'm really excited about has been the key to learning for me and has been um, how I learn best. So speaking of making things that you wish existed in the world but don't, several years ago, a video game review site called Kotaku published an article about Super Nintendo add-ons that never made the cut. This is an ad for a Super Nintendo knitting add-on, and you heard that correctly. Um, the interface was going to be like Mario Paint, but everything that you drew, it would come out as a scarf um, in the knitting machine. So this add-on never made it to production, and most of the comments on the Kotaku article were like, lol, we can see why. Um, my reaction was that I'd never wanted something to exist more in my life. Um, so I researched whether Nintendo had made any prototypes that I could get a hold of and hack, and I couldn't find anything. But I did find out that um, home knitting machines were popular in the 80s and 90s, even though um, they became less popular since. Um, and I was able to find one on Craigslist. Uh, so I brought it into the Airbnb office where I was working at the time, um, and for an Airbnb hackathon project, five other coworkers and I tried to figure out how we could make something like the Nintendo knitting add-on that never was. So the first day of the three-day hackathon was just about learning how to use this machine um, because it had so many moving parts and the manual for it was uh, like half an inch thick um, and it was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Um, the second day we focused on learning how to knit the built-in patterns our first attempt is on the left, and you can see how well that went. Um, and on the right is a few hours later where you can tell that we were trying to knit polka dots. So once we were confident that we had learned how to use the normal functionality of the machine, it was now our goal to be able to hack it to send our own patterns and images. Um, and this was important because all the built-in patterns looked like 80s and 90s clip art. So um, since it was from that era, the machine used to take in additional patterns via floppy drive. And so in order to send it our own patterns, we emulated a floppy drive on a computer and sent the knitting machine one bit bitmaps, which was the image format they used, via a USB to serial, serial port cable that we had to put together ourselves because the knitting machine had a weird pinout. Um, and then for the third step, we put the one bit bitmap converter and floppy disk emulator on a server so that anyone on the office could upload photos to the knitting machine via a web interface. Um, so uploading this image of a doge gives you this yarn printout, kind of like this, um, which with additional arm pieces you can turn into a full sweater. Um, so I guess the point of my talk is if there's something that's your equivalent of a networked sweater printer, your dream magical device that you wish existed in the world but doesn't currently, I hope that you get a chance to build it and learn from it. And please show me because I'd love to see. Thank you so much for having me.